programming as an information-centered activity. My goal here for today is to make the argument that the normal work of programming involves sophisticated information skills, particularly information seeking. That these skills belong in the classroom and should be taught, demonstrated, and be described as an essential skill equal to learning the core vocabulary and syntax and experience of programming. I will review an existing model of experiential learning and then describe my own model of how programming is integrated into information activities and how they actually depend a lot on each other. So and finally, I'll touch on some of the essential information skills and how to present them in the classroom. So some background about myself and where I'm coming from with this presentation. I'm a current master's student at the Graduate School of Library and Information Science. I actually worked inside of software for five years before starting the program. And I'm really interested in teaching uh, library science students, librarians, and other students who have non-STEM backgrounds programming. I've led and taught develop, um, several Python workshops from an all-day event to several week-long events. And what I'm going to be presenting is mostly based on my own personal observation, and it's meant to be informal in that capacity, uh, and things that I found really useful in teaching. Uh, information science have a ten people have a tendency to look at how people use systems with an eye for how they're using information. So I've been watching my students and listening to my peers at Gislis and observe several trends of how I feel programming classes and materials should address. And I'm going to be talking about them today. So who's familiar with this sort of meme image? <laughs> it might be a little bit old, but I think it's pretty accurate. I have computer science, and what my friends think I do, what my mom thinks I do, society, you know. And then it ends with what I really do. And in case you can't read it, it's the Google search, and the box says how to Java. I unfortunately could not find the Python version of this image, but I think the point stands. Uh, the last box here is making the claim that what programmers really do is Google things. I don't entirely disagree with this, and I often jokingly describe some of my more frustrating tasks in terms of the ratio of Google searches to lines of code that I've produced. This semester has been particularly awful for that. <laughs> so if searching for help online is so ubiquitous, why isn't it addressed better in the existing learning materials? And why are these skills not always being shown inside the classroom? Many students have often asked me uh, when the learning curve ends as a beginner. And my stuck answer to this has been, when I got really good at searching for my questions on Google. So how can we model that behavior, and how can we model and inform our students to, ha to succeed in that capacity? So let's talk a little bit about what the students are coming at us with. Students often approach their coursework, such as a MOOC, or their college class, or self-study with a book or some other material, with this sort of expectation model. First you read the book, and you do all the homework your teacher tells you to. And something magical happens in your head, or something. Maybe it's in your brain, maybe you get nerdier glasses. Something happens to you. It's kind of unknown. And then magically after that, you get a dev job. And the world is beautiful. And it's this middle phase that students are really unclear about. Uh, the path between picking up your first book on Python and getting a Python developer job is really unclear. Uh, and it's often a, a dead zone for academic resources for uh, so the self-taught student or students outside of a formal CS program. Students inside these CS programs obviously have a very clear structure. It's a four-year program. You know, uh, but students outside of that in a different domain or students outside the college classroom, students in high school, what are they supposed to do? And what about, every, yeah, what about everyone else? So the reality that I think students are being sort of unprepared for in making this transition between beginner to intermediate expert is that you think you know everything because you've gone through Learn Python the hard way. And then you start going, oh yeah, I'm going to do my first project. It's going to be awesome. And you like are facing the problems and you're like, I have no idea what I'm doing. But having no idea what you're doing when you're facing these problems is kind of the norm for a lot of us. And, but part of our jobs is to work through it. And so how can we better prepare students to work through this challenge, particularly if they're students who are independent and self, being self-taught? 
So the problems I just described are fundamentally information problems, and solved via information activities. But what do I mean by that? In the context of programming skills, information activities are related to learning and solving problems are information, or sorry, <laughs> information activities related to programming skills are iterative tasks requiring external references and conceptual mapping to integrate answers into a student's mental model of the universe. That's an incredibly ambiguous, broad definition and very much inside the context of programming education. Um, I like to describe programs in the act of writing a computer program in terms of writing a research paper because it really highlights the core information problems. If we think of a program as a paper, we can say that we start with a thesis statement. For example, write a Fahrenheit to Celsius converter. It's a pretty classic beginner's problem. So when we're approaching writing an essay or a paper, we start with this core statement, this thesis statement for our project. It's the thing that we're trying to show support for or prove. So I need to go out and do some research on it. In this case, I need to find supporting evidence. Excuse me. Are these units compatible for conversion? Well, we know they are. What's the formula? That's pretty easy to find out. Are there standard tools or approaches for this? Haha, <laughs> that's a Google answer away. Finally, I need to string all of these arguments together into a paper, which can be seen as our main function. We're used to thinking about a program in series of functions and classes that are strung together to achieve our goal and tell our story, but each function and class is there for a reason, to support your thesis. Programs simply use math and other logical tools to create this supporting evidence and put it all together in our main function to tell the story in a cohesive way. So let's switch gears a little bit and explore how you think about certain, how you use certain arguments and over others and why you use certain approaches over others. Let's think about your last project. Why did you go with one strategy over another? And how would you describe that choice to a junior colleague? Do you say, oh, because I just knew it and I'm just right? Or do you explain it in terms of a story? For example, we might hear a few, a few stories going, well, I looked at stuff in Stack Overflow for an hour until I found something that finally worked. So I went with it. Or you might hear something like, so in the last project, there was something similar. And I hit my head against the wall for a week, and learning that doing this solution is the least infuriating of them all. Chances are, it's going to have some experiential topic behind it. It's going to be a story of why you have that perspective. And the answer should not be, because you're just awesome. <laughs> Maybe if you have an intern. But even that. <laughs> So what do these two statements have in common, and what can they tell us about the act of coding? So I'm going to describe Kolb's experiential learning cycle model that he developed in 1984. Uh, this is really meant for more formal academic studies, but I think we can expand it to programming pretty well. Uh, this is a repeating cycle, kind of starting here at the top with concrete experience. Moving down to reflection, conceptualization, and experimentation. The wording here is a little strange, but it makes more sense when you explain it. So this first step of concrete experience, uh, this is where the student makes an initial discovery of something. They observe that something works. Then they move down to observe, uh, reflection on that observation. Okay, well, I see that works. I see it consistently works. Well, what's going on that's making that work? So they reflect on what they've seen. And they moved down to conceptualization, and eventually, in theory, they figured out why it works. They've seen it work, they've seen it consistently work, and now they're explaining why it works. Once they have that explanation on why, then they move into active experimentation, which is a name I kind of don't like, but this is basically the stage where the student starts using it regularly inside of their work. In programming terms, let's start back at the top and let's take a student who is learning about string slicing in Python. The student needs to get a clean way to find the last element of a list. They look things up in the docs and they see the negative one notation in the for the index. The students may say, well that seems weird, but I trust the docs. The docs tell me to do it, and so let me just see what happens. So they try it out, and they observe, yeah that's weird, but that works. Uh, this reflection of, yeah it works, and it works consistently, 
moves down into kind of conceptualization of, okay, well, negative one appears to sort of mean the last in Python, and that's pretty neat. And, if, and maybe answered why it's negative one, I think we can all have a conversation about that one. Um, and the student begins to experiment and where else it can be used. And they start using it in their other programs and their aspects of their code as well. The cycle starts over, say, when the student discovers that negative one also works to return the last element of a list. I already said list, but let's say a string. Let's say they started with a string, they found it'll give you the last character, and then they tried it on a list, and they found it also gives you the last element of that list. And they build, and they build, and they build. And they discover there's a lot of power to this idiom of negative one. So moving into my model, we have here, this is one big old loop. And again, this is very informal. This is meant to just be a framework to kind of keep things in mind, and not necessarily to be an explicit scientific process. So your particular situation might have a disagreement with this, and that's totally fine, and I would love to chat you with you about that. Um, at the top, we have these blue boxes here, which are information-seeking activities. At the bottom, we have these pink boxes, which are your coding activities. And we start here with resource discovery and evaluation, which feeds into learning syntax and data structures. So this is your initial step. When you have a pure beginner, they're absolutely starting here. And you can even, as you're getting into more advanced things, still exit out of the primary loop and start back in here. So this first stage always starts with resource discovery. For example, they might Google how to Python, and they find some interesting books and websites, and they roll with it. Student so begins working through that material and mentally ingesting all of the core structures and syntax of that domain. This ingestion process allows the student to begin moving into the primary loop, which is over here inside these dotted lines. Generally, the primary loop is going to work kind of clockwise over here. They're going to usually enter in into incorporations of idioms and patterns they're seeing inside the syntax and data structures. Once they have that and they're developing this core, developing this core vocabulary, they're going to move up here into learning how to look things up. You can't exactly Google it, how to do string slicing if you don't know what the word string slicing is. How would you describe that if you don't have those words? You can't ask questions if you don't have the right vocabulary, and you certainly won't get the right answers in your search activity until you do. From there, once you can effectively look things up in that area, you're going to discover all kinds of new and interesting domains, as well as new answers and, and new topics and techniques. When you discover new things, and you can apply these new and novel concepts to solve, to solve your existing problems. From there, you start memorizing those new patterns and those new idioms, which then further informs your ability to look things up. So beginner is going to kind of stay in here for a while. So they're going through learning a list, learning dictionaries, how to sort things, doing some recursive problems, and for loops and while loops, and what does all that mean, and logic structures. And then eventually, that, this beginner is going to start to want to specialize. The student might, say, be interested in specializing in web applications, data analysis, games, etc. Maybe they have a Raspberry Pi they want to do something cool with. Uh, being able to look things up is more about just than just being able to read the documentation. It's going to help you find those domain-specific resources. And students will need to identify these supplementary or new educational resources to really continue their studies to sort of make that leap between beginner to intermediate to expert. And these resources might be books, YouTube videos, conference tutorials, etc. They need to be able to find them and they need to be able to assess them. These new resources then get put back into their mental model and the cycle starts over. So you might exit out of here when you realize that you need to go into a whole new domain. For example, someone who does hardcore web application development might want to start going into more data analysis and statistics inside of Python. And so they're going to exit out back here, look through a whole new domain set of resources, start learning those brand new data structures. So imagine going from like Django to pandas, you know. You're going to exit out here for a little bit while you're sort of like learning the lingo of pandas. And eventually you're going to incorporate these new idioms and patterns into your daily language, be able to look things up, and the cycle starts over again. And you're just building and building and building in this cycle. So what are the key skills for the primary loop? The first one 
is to have this core vocabulary. Be able to understand the common synonyms that are used. Like most of us will say list, some people might say array. You might hear all kinds of things. But to know in the context of Python, particularly for beginners, that array and a list are somewhat synonymous. I know those might be fighting words for some people, but for the absolute beginner, we're just going to tell them that it's synonymous <laughs> for the time being. Um, also being able to use canonical terms for items as well. So Python calls things dictionaries. Java people might say maps, but we know in Python it's called a dictionary. There are other canonical terms like the dunder notation as well, being able to sort of describe and read that out. And when someone starts talking about dunder in it, like... What do they mean by that? But knowing like how to translate that and knowing the canonical terms, particularly for your domain. Uh, know how to assess sources. So for example, which website to go to inside of Google search results. When you're looking at a list of things uh, in there and you see python.org, you probably want to hit that one or you might want to go straight for Stack Overflow, depending on what's going on. And also understanding that persistence is key in this. These are drills. You have to practice. You have to keep going and keep refining your search until you find what you need. So finally, I have some general suggestions for the classroom. And again, my experiences are usually with the college and graduate student crowd. But I feel like a lot of these will be applicable for the high schoolers. Um, the formal docs for Python might not be too awesome for like the elementary schoolers, but they might be using Scratch in that case. So these are general recommendations. So first off, always be clear and explicit with students about what to expect in daily programming activities. Looking things up in documentation and reference books is normal and should be treated as an essential part of any programming activity. Having a set of go-to resources to recommend to students is also vital. This should include reference books, such as pocket guides or cookbooks, but also websites, including the formal documentation and informal tutorials. And these should be appropriate for their educational level and also what the course is focusing on. Incorporate resource discovery and usage as part of your live, live coding demos. Actively use the documentation or other resources during the lesson so that students can see how and when it is used in the process. Be sure to walk through the steps of how to effectively craft searches related to their code. For example, if you have a long line of code that has assignment statements, variables, local, yeah, local variable names, as well as functions, explain to students why they might, have, might want to first start with searching for the function name rather than including anything that has their local variable names. That really confounds searches and confuses students. Also, talk to students about how to assess resources. We cover this like in our basic English research classes, where we learn when we do a Google search, we should look at what the URLs have. And if it says .edu or .org, you should probably preface, preface that over a .com when you're looking for an unbiased source. It's the same thing with documentation. Know to look not just at the titles of the pages, but the URLs. Know what Stack Overflow is. Know that docs.python.org is a really good place to start with. Part of this conversation should also cover the differences between the certain types of resources. For example, what is a cookbook and how is it different from a pocket guide or your formal textbook and when it is, it, when is it appropriate to use one of those? And why would one want to use one of those? Finally, students should leave their classes not only knowing the basic syntax of the language, but how to be effective at solve their own, solving their own problems and getting answers to their questions that come up. And a big part of that is being explicit. Like, if you have a problem, search for it. And if you had take five minutes and you can't find it in five minutes, then come ask me. But students really need that practice for effective searching. So that's it. I'll put my Twitter up on here. So feel free to tweet me, ask questions, tell me that my model needs total improvement because I would love to hear commentary about it from different perspectives. Uh, so thank you so much.